very glad after the holidays time to be able to resume our regular afternoon service. We were just getting started. Only had a, a couple of messages from, from Genesis in this new series. And I have to tell you, I really do... Um, I really do enjoy doing this new series. I'm excited about going through the whole uh, scriptures, all 66 books, and I've I've wanted to do this for a long time, and uh, it's very it's very encouraging to me to be able to do this. I hope that you are also remembering to read along in the Bible. That this is a time when you can read through the scriptures as you keep up with the, the sermons. I'm making it easy because I'm doing two messages instead of just one on uh, on some of these books. That's going to be the plan for Exodus as well. But my plan is to go through all 66 books with at least one message on every book, and usually not more than two. Um, no, no, I have any plans to do more than two. But we're, we're looking at this, particularly each book in the Bible as it pertains to us today, which is really important. The scriptures are so unique because they're written in such a way that they speak to us, to God's people in every generation. About not only is the Bible God's word and infallible and without error, but it's also something that is, speaks to each generation. It was written not only, God presented it, gave it through prophecy, not only for the original recipients, but also for people that would come after them to show us things about Him, to show us things about Christ, to show us how we are to live. Paul we, reminds us of this in Romans 15, 4, when he says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So in this series, looking at each book as it applies to us today. So far, we've only done the book of Genesis. And today we're covering the first part of Exodus. We're doing the first 15 verses. And next week, we're going to back up into that a little bit and go from chapter 12, we're going to be a little bit of overlap, to chapter 40. That's my plan anyway. So like Genesis, Exodus was written by Moses around 3,500 years ago, about 1,500 years before Christ came. It's really a continuation of Genesis. One fellow noted that it begins with the word and, which is interesting. Genesis actually ends the way a book with a sequel would end. The family of Jacob or Israel had received promises from God that they would grow into a great nation. They would multiply greatly in the land of Egypt and that eventually they were going to bring forth a son of promise who would bring salvation to all the nations of the world. But that before this, they were told that they were be brought out of the land of Egypt and given the land of Canaan. And that was something that was made very clear to them. And of course, the, the son that was promised was promised back in Genesis 3.15 originally, who would be born of a woman and who would crush the head of the serpent who had led the human race into rebellion. God had promised to the family of Jacob that he would make them into this great nation and give them the land of Canaan as their inheritance, this great nation that would bring forth that son and give them Canaan as their inheritance. And that from here they would bring forth this son that would save them as well as the nations from their sins. However, God had revealed to Abraham that they would not inherit Canaan for 400 years from the time when God said that to Abraham. That first... They had to go to Egypt and be in bondage there for a time. So then at the end of Genesis, okay, how does it end? We have Jacob's family, fairly small yet, in Egypt. They're beginning to multiply, but we have them there with Jacob's son Joseph as an old man, reminding them that God will surely visit them in Egypt at the appointed time to bring them out from there. So that's how it ends. It's looking to the future of God visiting them in that place in Egypt and bringing them out. He has them uh, promise, Joseph has the, the people he's speaking to, to promise to bring his bones to Canaan in that day and bury him in the land of promise with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. His bones then were a standing reminder to the people 
through the time that they were in Egypt, that God was going to bring them out. As they saw Joseph's bones, God's going to bring us out, and we're supposed to take those bones with us when we go. It was a, a way of giving them a, a visible token of God's promise that he was going to bring them out when it got bad in Egypt, when they, became, when they were brought under bondage. So Exodus then is a continuation of their history, picking up with them in the bondage that was foretold that they would be in, at a time when deliverance had come, when redemption was drawing near. So the beginning of Exodus is very similar to the beginning of Luke. Things are being told. God is going to visit his people. His time has come for this to be fulfilled. He's going to redeem you. Now, so redemption is a key word in Exodus. It, it's, uh, redemption is a word that is used for deliverance from bondage to slavery. In the ancient world, when a loved one was made a slave, maybe in payment of a debt or something, they couldn't pay their bills, so they had to sell themselves into slavery, something like that. Or when they were taken uh, as a slave through time of war, then it was the duty and obligation of a close relative of theirs who had the ability to do so to redeem them. What did that mean? Well, they would redeem them in one of two ways, either by purchasing them purchasing their freedom by buying them out of slavery if they had been sold into sla slavery to pay a debt, or by rescuing them, by conquering the people that had conquered them, raising up an army and going in and bringing them out. And there's a sense in which God does both when he redeems his people out of Egypt. Exodus is the account of God redeeming his people from bondage in Egypt to make them a nation that is governed by him rather than by Egypt in the promised land. There are also many lessons for us here because God shaped this history deliberately in a way that reveals to us the redemption that he has for his people in Christ Jesus. So not only is it written in a way that reveals this, but you see the events themselves that happen in history were arranged by the sovereign God to reveal something of how he redeems people in Christ. So he brought Israel into Egypt deliberately. He put them in bondage there deliberately and then delivered them in a way that shows us three things. How we are brought, how we are in bondage Okay, to Satan and his rebellion that he started, how he is the Lord who redeems us out of bondage, is the second thing. And the third thing, how he forms us into a people of his own, a people for himself. So those are the three things I want to look at as God's message to us today revealed in Exodus. Again, it's how we're in bondage to Satan and his rebellion, how God is the Lord who redeems us from that bondage and how he forms us into a people for himself. Now that third point we're going to look at next week. I'm sure you'll be glad that I decided to do that next week rather than this week because it would have been a really long message if I had done it this week, which is what I originally planned to do. So we're going to just have those first two points. So let's get started first. How God shows us in Exodus that we are in bondage to Satan and, and his rebellion. We're we're in bondage to that rebellion, to sin, as it were. Exodus opens with the description of Israel, God's people, in bondage to Egypt. You can look at chapter 1. We're told that Joseph and his generation of Jacob's sons have died. Okay, 1-6. You see that? Chapter 1, verse 6. But in accordance with God's promise, God has caused them to multiply in a marvelous way. He had promised that they would be fruitful and multiply, even though they were in that land uh, that was not their own. If you look at Exodus 1-7, you see, but the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly, multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. So everywhere you looked in Egypt, <laughs> there were people of Israel. They, were, they had multiplied like crazy. But we're also told in the rest of, the chap of chapter 1 that a king arose in Egypt, another pharaoh, who did not know Joseph. Of course, Joseph had been in great favor with the pharaoh in his day, but
but now those years have been forgotten. It's a couple of centuries later, and, uh, you know, that time is, is past. You think how long that is, you know, a couple hundred years. It's, uh, you forget about how things were. So he's concerned, this new Pharaoh, he's concerned about Israel multiplying. This is dangerous for us. And he wants to suppress them. He is afraid that they will overpower his kingdom. So in an effort to keep them from rising, he puts them to forced servitude. Very cruel servitude in which he deliberately afflicts them. We learn in verse 12 what always seems to happen whenever anybody tries to do such things to God's people, when they try to suppress the church, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, what happens? The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And that, that's the thing that always irritates persecutors because they keep persecuting and then like, these people keep, they keep popping up everywhere. Everywhere we turn, they keep coming forward. So the result is that the Egyptians were in dread, it says, of the children of Israel. Verse 13, so the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. They turned up the, the, the rigor of their bondage. Pharaoh even ordered the midwives, as you read on in the chapter, to kill the sons of the Israelites at birth so that they wouldn't multiply so fast. It didn't work because the midwives didn't really want to do that. You can imagine a woman that's trained as a midwife. She doesn't want to take a newborn child and, and, and kill it in her hands. So you know, they, they, didn't, they didn't do that. So the sons were, were, were born still. And uh, so then uh, Pharaoh ordered them to be killed um, that had already been born and were already, I mean, not, not the birth, had already passed the birth time, he ordered that the, the boys be killed. This is a very bad move on Pharaoh's part for his own sake because now the result is that the Lord is going to kill Pharaoh's son for killing his son. So that's the, what's going to come back on him. But, um, but the bondage and the oppression that Israel experiences, what we need to learn from this is the same kind of bondage and oppression that we're all in before God redeems us. Okay, this is a picture of us before redemption. See, Pharaoh and the Egyptians are agents of Satan in the rebellion that Satan started back in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, as the serpent, Satan, the devil, the old dragon, he led Adam and Eve to reject God as their God. We saw that. And uh, Adam was the representative of the whole human race, all that were to be born of him. When he, made, when he rebelled against God, he brought us all into rebellion. Satan succeeded in this. He did bring us into bondage. We, we were told in, but we're told in Genesis 3.15 that God would raise up a people led by a son that would be born to turn against Satan and the rebellion that Satan started to bring us out of bondage to rebellion against God and that he would overthrow Satan for all those who followed him. Satan is obviously terrified because he knows this. God said, told Satan this and he's obviously terrified when he sees God's people multiplying. It makes him very uneasy. He doesn't want to see God's people multiplying. And that's why Pharaoh, Satan's minion, is terrified when he sees Israel multiplying. And why the Egyptians are terrified. These people are going to take over. They're going to change their way of life. They're going to lead us to follow God. They're terrified today as, in the same way as they see Christians multiplying in Iraq and Iran and China and India and parts of Africa in remarkable ways. Many, many Christians are coming to serve the Lord and they're terrified at the threat. The Christians are going to take over our nation. They're going to change our way of life. We can't have this. We don't want this. So Satan wants to suppress them. And he has his agents, the leaders, the dictators, the rulers, whoever they are, as well as the people of the kingdom, these various kingdoms, it's incredible to see the alliances that are formed against Christians. For example, in Canada here, you have Muslims and feminists who have opposite principles. Yet when it comes to a Christian, then they're both band together to oppose those who are following Christ. Because 
I'd rather have the feminists, the Muslim says, than to have those Christians in the, being the dominant people. I'd rather have the Muslims, the feminist says, than those Christians to be the dominant people. That, such is the vitriol against Christ, against the Lord and his anointed. Satan brought us into rebellion with him against God, and he does not want us to turn back to God and start serving God again. So he does everything that he can to keep us in bondage. If he can, he will force us to serve him. If he can, he will kill us in an effort to keep us from multiplying. He will even try to convince us that we would be better off to serve him than to serve God, to keep on serving him. We see all these three approaches in Exodus. We've just looked at the forced labor, and we've looked at the murder, and it did not keep them from multiplying. The forced labor, however, did prevent them for a time until they were redeemed from worshiping God. That's the picture we have here. God wanted them to come worship. They couldn't do that because they were in bondage to Pharaoh. They had to serve Pharaoh. They, didn't, they couldn't do what they wanted to do. All he wanted was them to go out and offer sacrifices in the wilderness. You can't do that, Pharaoh said. Satan has them in bondage to do his will, to serve the idols of Egypt. And Pharaoh is one of the gods that they all served. And uh, there are sins in our lives that hold us in bondage to Satan as ways that we can't get free of, sins that we, we're unable to break until God redeems us. Even though God is calling us to serve him, we're in bondage, and we can't escape until we're born again. There, that is the condition we're in when God first comes and calls us to repent and follow him as our redeemer. And later on in Exodus, we see the third approach. Satan trying to make the people think that they would be better off serving him instead of God. It's repeated again and again. The people become discouraged again and again, and again and again they say that we would be better off if we had stayed in Egypt, serving Pharaoh. In Exodus 14, 2, they actually say, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And so it is for us when persecution and trouble comes, the people who are not actually redeemed yet and still in bondage to sin will sometimes say that and they will go back to the world because of persecution, like the parable of the sower talks about, or because of um, the, the temptations of the world and the, what the world offers. They'll say, no, it's better for us to serve the world, to serve Satan, they don't say those words, but to, to go away from this Christian thing and to go and follow our old way of life. Such is the condition of our bondage until God rescues us. It's universal. We have no will to be delivered unless the Lord supernaturally draws us to himself. Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. And that leads us to the next thing that the Lord reveals to us in Exodus. That it is by God's sovereign hand that we're brought out of bondage. That he is the Lord who redeems us from bondage. We see right away the unwavering commitment that God has to his people. Moses comes on the scene in chapter 2 and 3. First is an infant who is marvelously rescued, and you can't go into the details, so you can read it yourself, and who providentially is adopted by Pharaoh's daughter, enabling him to be prepared for the work that God has given him to do as he's educated with the education of the Egyptians and such. Then we see Moses with a heart to deliver Israel rather than to live in the luxuries of Egypt, but unable to pull it off, resulting in discouragement and fear on his part. So much is his weakness that he, he leaves Egypt, he marries a woman outside of uh, his people, and he doesn't even circumcise his son. I mean, he's not, Moses isn't, he's not trusting in the promise anymore, because he, he's tried, he's failed, he's discouraged, he goes away, he doesn't even circumcise his son. But then God calls him at the burning bush to go to Pharaoh and act as his spokesman for the deliverance of his people from bondage. Moses is to be the evangelist that God has called to go and proclaim the good news to his people that God is going to visit them with salvation and deliver them from bondage in Egypt. And by the way, on the way, God says, Moses, you circumcise your son or I'm going to kill you. And he does. 
Because the promise, you see, was in that circumcision that the son would come that was going to bring uh, salvation to God's people. And in the Lord's calling of Moses, we also learn of the Lord's unwavering commitment to his people in two ways. Okay, so we, we see the Lord's commitment in raising up Moses to deliver them, to be an evangelist, to call them to freedom. And then we see two other ways that he has compassion on his people when he sees them struggling under bondage. Okay, that's the first expression of God's commitment, his compassion for them. And the second thing, that he remembers the promise that he made to their fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So let's look at these two things. The compassion is seen when he appears to Moses at the burning bush in chapter 3 and says in verse 7 through 10, listen to the words. Now this is God speaking. Think about the compassion here. This is what he says when he sees you before you're redeemed. God sees you as someone that he has his eye on, his elect, that he, someone that he's going to redeem. He says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. Okay, you're in the world and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me. That's what our compassionate God says. And I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you, he says to Moses, to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. This shows us the tender mercy of God towards sinners when he sees them wallowing in bondage under the hand of Satan, weary in service to him. And he begins, you see, when he calls us, he begins to open our eyes so that you become discontent with the world and, and being in that bondage and you want to be released and you begin to look to God and to cry out to Him many, in many cases to be released from Satan and the world. We feel the burden of it and the futility of our sin and we start to cry under that affliction. This in turn stirs up the Lord's compassionate heart to come and redeem us and to bring us out. And the second thing, the Lord's unwavering commitment to his promise to our fathers and to the covenant he has made with them, that's the second thing, is seen in chapter 6. Here you see how his covenant promise goes hand in hand with his compassion. Look at chapter 6, beginning in verse 2. It says, And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. That's very significant. Name Yahweh there. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. Okay, that was how he was known, God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, or Yahweh, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them. He made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. To give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. So they never got the land while they were alive. They were strangers in the land. But I promised to give it to them down the road in their families and their descendants. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So God is going to deliver them because He is the God of their fathers. Because He made solemn covenant promises to their fathers. His commitment is so strong that later on in chapter 32, when the people have been vile and they have worshipped an idol, a golden calf that they have made, after God has delivered them from Egypt, then the Lord threatens to destroy them all and to raise up another nation for Moses to lead. 
But when Moses pleads to God for them in Exodus 32, 13, he pleads on the basis of God's covenant promise that God had made. That the Lord, and the Lord relents and has mercy on Israel because of his promise. His covenant promise that he had made to the fathers. This adds additional assurance to us as God's people of the Lord's unwavering love and commitment to us. Okay, he's showing us what He is like so that we can take comfort in what God is like. He's compassionate to you. If you're burdened with sin, He's compassionate to you and He desires to redeem you and pull you out of that sin. And on the other hand, His promise that He has made, He's not going to go away from that covenant promise that He has secured to you through you and through your, your fathers. So this additional assurance gives us uh, confidence in what God is like. For all of this, we are greatly strengthened when we see what He's done to keep His promise. Us today, we have an even greater assurance because we see how great God's commitment is in that now He has even sent His Son from heaven to die on the cross for our sins. So we have... Full assurance. He's compassionate. He's so committed to His covenant that He even sent His Son from heaven in order to fulfill what He had promised. But His commitment to save us is not the only thing that He shows us in Exodus to make us sure of His redemption. He also reveals His mighty arm by which He redeems us from bondage. God has the strength to deliver us from Satan. We are not in such bondage that God cannot deliver us. He tells us plainly that it is his intention to reveal that he is Lord, Yahweh. In the passage that we just looked at in chapter 6, God mentions that to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was not known by his name Lord. Okay, he tells us that he was not known to them by the name Lord or Yahweh which is usually translated L-O-R-D in all capital letters in our um, English Bibles. But in chapter 3 at the burning bush, God revealed this name to Moses in 3.14 after Moses has asked who he should say has sent him. The Lord says, or it says, the passage says, And God said to Moses, I am who I am. Now that's the meaning of the word Yahweh. And he said, this, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am Yahweh has sent me to you. This name Yahweh, which means I am, refers to God's uniqueness from all other gods as the only one who is self-existing and uncreated. He simply, I am. Okay, he doesn't have, a, he wasn't made, he didn't evolve from something, he just is. For all eternity. Since false gods were called gods at this time when, when Moses was in Egypt, then God as the true God revealed himself by this name Yahweh to distinguish himself from other gods, so-called gods. Since the time of the flood, the nations of the world had gradually twisted the truth about God till the distortions were so great that their idolatrous versions of God could no longer properly be called God. What they were worshiping was no longer God at all. The nations had made rulers like Pharaoh to be their gods, and demons to be their gods, and ancestors and saints, you might say, holy men that had lived before that they made into their gods and they prayed to and worshiped. It's no different today. You have people who trust in government, to take care of them, who pray to false gods like Allah or Vishnu or Shiva, or who trust in saints or ancestors to save them. God makes it clear that it is His intention to show the Israelites that He alone is Yahweh, the Lord, the sovereign, self-existing God. He tells Moses this in chapter 6, verse 7. We read a minute ago in 6.6, 6, I'll read that again, where he says, Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And then in verse 7, he explains the result. They're going to know him as Lord. 
Yahweh. It says, I will take you, this is 6-7, I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God, who brings you out from the, under the burdens of the Egyptians. In other words, at the end of the encounter with Pharaoh, which was not going very well at first, when Moses first went to, to, to ask for their release, Moses, Moses had gone to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh had been angered and, and made the bondage of Israel even worse, forcing them to make bricks without straw, to the same number of bricks that they were making when straw was provided for them. But God tells Moses that the outcome of all of this is going to be that they will know that he is Lord. They will know that he is the sovereign, self-existing God of all power. At the end of the whole ordeal, after all the plagues and the parting of the Red Sea, they do know that. God is showing us here the almighty power that he exerts to deliver us from our bondage to the devil and his minions to Pharaoh or the world or whatever our idols might be. When he has delivered us by his mighty power, we learn that he is truly the Lord and that there is no one like him in heaven and earth. But it's not only Israel that God shows this to. Do you know who else God shows it to that he's Lord? He shows it to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. They also learn that he's Lord. When Moses first goes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh makes a huge mistake when he responds to Moses' uh, request from God to let, God says, let my people go. You remember what Pharaoh says? Let them go worship me. In 5.2, Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I shall obey him to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. I will not let Israel go. And that's never a thing to say to God if you're his enemy. Because if you say that to God, he's going to show you who he is. Pharaoh is going to find out the hard way who the Lord is, that he should obey him. God tells Moses that he will be glorified in the eyes of the Egyptians. and They also, like Israel, but in a different way, will see that he's the Lord. He clearly explains this to Moses in chapter 7, verse 4 and 5. He says, look, this is what's going to happen. Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great judgment. God says, this is deliberate. Pharaoh is, you're going to ask Pharaoh to let, let the people of Israel go, and he's going to say, no, this is my plan, because then I'm going to reveal that I'm Lord over Pharaoh, who thinks he's big stuff and can do whatever he wants. I'm going to show him that I am the Lord. He says, and the Egyptians, verse 5, shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Isn't this one of the worst problems that, that we have today, that the world has today? We don't know that he's Lord. We don't realize that. And uh, so he goes on, Exodus, in Exodus 9, the Lord even speaks to Pharaoh himself and tells him that he gave him power and raised him up to his position so that he could show that he was Lord by bringing him down. That's his purpose. Look at it. It says in 9.14, Exodus 9.14, it says, At this time, the Lord says, I will send all my plagues to your very heart, Pharaoh, and on your servants and on your people, that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Now, if I had stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, then you would have been cut off from the earth. God says, I could have sent a plague through here, and you would have died like that. It would have been the end of you. But I chose not to do that deliberately. Instead, I gave you power and raised you up so that I can make my purpose. Verse 16. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. And it was, by the way, people all over the world heard about what had happened here. Brothers and sisters, this is what God does when he redeems people. He does it in such a way that everyone might see that he is Lord, that he is the self-existing sovereign Lord Yahweh. He has raised up Satan himself 
and given Satan great power in the earth and dominion in the earth for his own purposes that he might be glorified in overthrowing him and showing that he is Lord. This is how God for his glory displays himself to his creatures. When we are rescued from bondage to sin, from bondage to Satan, and from bondage to the world, we should praise God as Lord of all because you know that you did not rescue yourself. He's the one that rescued you from bondage. When we see others who are rescued, we should praise God. What a wonderful thing it is when a sinner is delivered from bondage to serve the living God. In the last day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, Yahweh, that He is the self-existing God who alone is able to take sinners in bondage and to bring them out from the hand of their enemies. Much of the book of Exodus is taken up with God displaying Himself as Lord by redeeming His people. How does He do it? First of all, with the ten plagues. Hey, you have the ten plagues. We don't have time to go into each one of them in this overview. But one important fact is that each of them is a judgment on the idols of Egypt. For example, what do they worship? They worship the Nile River. It would flood and uh, fertilize their land every year and prepare for the crops and everything. They, they, they lived off of their wheat crop that went all over the world. They shipped it all over the place. And uh, the Nile River was a source of life to them, and something they worshipped. And in the first plague, the great river is turned to blood. And then later plague, the sun turned to darkness. Egyptians are known for sun worship. They worship the, the sun in the sky, the S-U-N sun. And uh, one of the plagues, God turned the land to complete darkness. They also worship Pharaoh. Yet in the tenth plague, God wipes out his firstborn son, who is going to be the next in line to be Pharaoh. We, don't, we assume that the Pharaoh that was then in power was not the firstborn son because he was not wiped out. But uh, he, in fact, wipes out all the firstborn sons in Egypt. And the firstborn sons were the ones that led their families. They were the priests. Like if you had an old grandfather, and he was in all of his descendants that were under him, he was the priest that led his family. And all of those firstborn sons, whatever age they were, we don't, don't just think of little babies. We're talking about anybody that was a firstborn son. Leaders in the community, they were wiped out in the 10th plague because they were worshiping. These were men that they would have worshiped as ancestors when they died. God showed his authority over them. By the plagues, God shows that he has authority over all the idols of Egypt. It is noteworthy as well that with the first plagues, the magicians of Egypt employed their trickery to imitate the plagues. But when the third plague came, just the third, there were ten of them, then uh, they give up and they tell Pharaoh, as recorded in uh, Exodus 8.18, this is the finger of God. They admit that this is something that is done by God that they can't deal with. This is done by who? The Lord. The sovereign, self-existing God. We cannot imitate this. All along the way as the plagues are enacted, Moses pleads with Pharaoh to let Israel go and worship him. And a few times, Pharaoh starts to cave, but often demanding certain compromises along the way that Moses does not accept. But then he changes his mind, even when he does decide, okay, you can go. And then he'll change his mind again and say, no, you can't go. His heart was hardened to the point of stupidity. So that in pride, he acted against his own best interests. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of what every sinner does when they resist God. They act against their own best interests. They ruin themselves by their resistance. But here it was made obvious to everyone. Because the whole land of Egypt was being ruined. It's like, look, this guy said that tomorrow the firstborn son's all going to die. Do you really think it's not going to happen? Nine other things that he said have happened. Do you think that it's not going to happen this time? And, and Pharaoh, you know, I will not let them go, right? It's, it, it was stupidity. The hardness of the human heart and the resistance and the rebellion against God and his calls. The face of judgment. Judgment's coming. And people harden themselves and say, I will not follow God. This way we're to see the glory of God, though. That he's Yahweh. 
This is demonstrated again, besides by the plagues, it's demonstrated at the Red Sea crossing. After the tenth plague, the Egyptians are eager, eager for Israel to leave. <laughs> they say, <laughs> get, get out. <laughs> like our, our land is being completely destroyed. We, get, get out, leave us, leave it. And, and Israel is instructed to ask them for provisions, and they give them gold and silver and everything. Yeah, what, what else do you want? Here, you know, here's my cupboard, here's my treasure chest. Like, what, what do you want? And they had you know, jewels and gold and everything. It says they plundered the Egyptians. Because they realize that, you know, our, our Pharaoh that we worship is being an idiot. So Israel leaves, but only to have Pharaoh decide that he's going to pursue them. Okay, after his firstborn son has died and everybody's mourning. And then let's go and pursue these guys. You know, it's well known what, the, what happens, what the result is. Here's, here's unarmed Israel. They've been slaves they don't know anything about war. They don't know about fighting, resisting. And Pharaoh, with his trained army, with chariots and weapons and everything all organized, is coming after them. And they turn and they see the army coming. And they look over here, there's mountains. They look over here, there's the sea. What are they, what are they going to do? They're, they're hemmed in. And so they begin to cry out and complain against Moses. And say, you brought us out here to, to ruin us. But then in... in in 1415, we read, And the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry out to me? Now, see, Moses himself wasn't crying out like this, but the, uh, the people were, and Moses was responsible for them. Why do you cry out to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. But lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am Yahweh, that I am the Lord, when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. I mean, look at this situation. These guys of Israel, they were completely helpless before the army of the Egyptians, the chariots, and the horsemen. And they, there was no way that they could deliver themselves. They were hemmed in, and God delivered them to show that He was the Lord so that He could be trusted. It was to reveal that God is the Lord. This is what we need to see most of all because we really don't see it. We're like Israel. We seem to think that there are things that are too hard for God to deal with. Too hard for Him to contend with. He shows us that He is Lord when He redeems us from bondage to the world. And then He goes on showing that until He brings us to glory at the last day. Those of us who believe respond as Israel did in Exodus 15 when He brought them across the Red Sea from the Egyptians to be his people. We believe, having been redeemed, having been delivered from bondage to serve God, we see the hand of God in that. If you have really been delivered by God, you know the hand of God and the power of God in your life. In Exodus 15, 1 and 2, it says, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. So let us give thanks to God for bringing us out from Satan and his bondage to him. We were just as helpless as Israel was before Satan's minion Pharaoh. Satan has his minions today. Worldly leaders who want us to trust them instead of God. Even ministers who lead us to worship idols instead of the true God. The whole system of the world that trusts in idols instead of the Lord Yahweh. Until the Lord Almighty delivers us, we are completely under their dominion. But in Christ, we are delivered from Satan 
to serve God. Next week, we're going to look at the third thing that God reveals to us in Exodus. How having delivered us from Satan and the world, he forms us into a people of his own. A people for himself. Please stand and let's give thanks to our great God. Our Father in heaven, we confess that you are the Lord. We confess that you and your Son and the Holy Spirit are Lord. That you are Yahweh. That you are the sovereign, self-existing God. And that there is no one like you. There is no one who can deliver as you deliver. There is no one that can hold us in bondage if you are if you are pleased to deliver us. Father, we come to you and we thank you for what else we saw about your character, that you're a God who has compassion on those who are in bondage and who are yearning to be set free from that bondage. Not people that want to be set free from their trouble in life, but people that want to be set free from the, demon, the bondage and the dominion of Satan. That when you see those who are yearning for that deliverance, that you never refuse them, that you always welcome them and bring them out. We thank you that it is you yourself that even gives us that desire, for we would have no will for it unless you gave us, made us willing in the day of your power. And Father, for that reason, we give you praise that our redemption from bondage is not of us, but it is of you. Father, we think even of our covenant children who have grown up knowing the ways of the Lord, and who have been given grace to follow you from their very earliest days. And what a marvelous thing that is, that against their nature, that, that their sinful nature, that they're able now to follow you as your people, and to receive your word and your promises, and to walk in your statutes because of your divine power and grace. We thank you, Lord, for those also that you have rescued, who are living in sin, and who are under the bondage and the dominion of Satan, and that you call them out in order that they might be your people and that they might serve you. Oh Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Continue your work in the world. Continue to deliver people. Continue to show Satan that you are Lord. Continue to show the world that you are Lord. Continue, oh Lord, to show us that you are Lord. And we pray, Lord, for that last day to come when it will all be made so very clear that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that even our Lord Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We thank you for that hope that we have and we look forward to that day in Jesus' name. Amen.